Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here for another episode of Secret Jews Uncovering Hidden Jewish Traditions. Today's episode is Hidden Hebrew, Hebrew words and phrases buried in the, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, Galabrezi dialect. Well, let's go ahead and give our sponsors their due. First, we have the wonderful documentary, Secret Jews of Calabria, uncovering Jewish traditions hidden for over 500 years. To find out how to get your copy or even have your group or organization host a viewing, simply visit rabbibarbara.com and you will find out more about that. I'm sure you'll hear a little bit about it right on this right on this episode. And Call Perkal of Ibex Motion, documentary film as a key to our past and our future. You can always contact Carl at cperkal, P-E-R-K-A-L, at netvision.net.il. Rabbi Barbara Aiello, Italy's first woman rabbi, and find out more about all the wonderful services that Rabbi offers by visiting rabbibarbara.com. And the William David Company, we're actually the proud producers of this series, The Secret Jews. And to find out more about the different services that we offer, we are your business marketing solutions, you can visit williamdavidcompany.com. Well, let's go ahead and bring on Rabbi Barbara and introduce her. She could say hello to everyone. Good afternoon where you are, right, Rabbi? That's right. I am in my studio in the uh, Calabrian Mountains in the little town of Sarastretta. We're 3,000 feet up from uh, Nicastra, uh, called La Mezia Terme in modern times, and uh, it is a beautiful afternoon. And Carl Percal. Welcome, Carl. Hi, everybody. Incredible, as usual, all the different places that we're being brought together from. I'm in Israel. I'm actually now... Maybe next time I'll uh, put the camera outside, but I am overlooking the ancient Roman town of Caesarea. Very, very historic area. All right. Well, Carl, I think you wanted to tell us a little bit about what we're going to see in a minute. I will, and I know I have to be brief. That <laughs> one, <of the, laughs> one of the tools, the detective tools, that are uh, that is used to kind of make the connection over hundreds of years between Jews then and people who might be Jewish today is language and I'll just give you two examples of from other areas you know the Dutch call Amsterdam Mokum and if anybody knows Hebrew they know that Mokum means place or the place and many Americans who say every hey how's it going and they say oh everything's copacetic well, many people believe that that's Hebrew from Hakol Besezer. Everything Hakol is Besezer. okay. So, so, so I think what we're looking for is to figure out with Rabbi today, and maybe a clip from the Secret Jews of Calabria, is how do we discover today the Jewish roots of families that come from Calabria, Italian people, and who have various clues just in the way they speak in their families to tell us something about whether they might indeed come from a Jewish background. So maybe we should take a look at the clip that tells us a little bit about this. Absolutely. I found Rabbi Barbara's website and she confirmed everything that I thought we were so different, why we were different, because um, even simple things like um, the Italian language, I studied Italian at university, and there's a word in our dialect that my grandmother used to say after we had dinner. She'd say, uh, ricogliamo i hamazzi which to me, I used to say, I looked it up and it's not Italian. I used to think, where is this word coming from? And it's only been since I've become more interested in my roots that I found out that it's a Jewish word. And, uh, and I thought maybe it was just every Calabresi knew the word. And because I have a school, a lot of my students are Calabresi. I used to ask, do you know the word Hamatsi? And they'd, some would say yes. And then I'd ask their surname and it was a, a Jewish surname. And others would say, no, we don't say that. We say Moliki. So, it was interesting. It's interesting piecing things together. Joanne talked about what you said, piecing things together. So uh, what, Rabbi, I, I didn't quite get that. She uses a word, maliki, and she says a word that kind of sounds like uh, hametz, uh, the, the things we're not supposed to eat on Passover. So what's going on here? Well, finding Joanne 
was a special blessing. And uh, because Joanne is an expert in the Italian language and also the dialects in these mountain villages, and she would speak um, of her family experiences and also she would encourage her students to talk about the, um, the special words that their family used and the difference between Moliki and Hametz is very interesting as, and uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that today. Moliki means crumbs. So after dinner, after you're sitting around the table and everyone talking and drinking their little digestivo and having the last sip of espresso, then they generally the mom of the family will say, okay everyone, let's clean up the moliki, the crumbs. But in, in families with Jewish traditions, they don't use that word. They use the word hametz. And Joanne could, she didn't she, she didn't understand why there were a, a whole group of words and phrases that were not common to to uh, to Italian, but she thought they were part of the mountain dialect. When in actuality they are part of the dialect, but they are derivative of uh, of the Hebrew language. It took my um, uh, my discussions with her, also my discussions with my husband, who uses the word hametz for all kinds of crumbs, and he said, oh, that's a dialect word. I said, no, no, that is a Hebrew word. It may be used in dialect, but it is a Hebrew word. Of course, hametz means the crumbs of the um, leavening, the leavening that we that we clean away uh, to uh, to ready ourselves for Passover when we eat no um, no no leavened bread. What I like to do, I'm going to hold this up here, I don't know how this, how this will show, but this is la lingua de padre, the language of our fathers. And it is a dictionary. It is the dictionary of the Lamentino dialect. And the Lamentino dialect would mean La Mestia and all of the surrounding mountain towns. And it takes kind of dogged work, if you will, to just go page by page and I'm going to give you an example of what I did when I heard comments. I looked it up, and I found I found that it says that it is a bruscolino, spazzatura, and pagliuca, which are arctic words for crumbs and things that you throw away. But then it also says foreign, a stra uh, una parola strana, a strange foreign word, and it is spelled. With interestingly enough, with a ch, chametz, just like we say it in Hebrew, and that's what I do. I go page by page, and when I hear some of these words and phrases, I look them up right away to see if they are considered to be strange words, and if they have a um, a Hebrew derivative. Wow! So uh, families in Calabria that are not from Jewish background might not even know what these words mean either. It might only no, be a family don't. thing. It might only be a family thing, and that's a very important point because uh, when I, I when we talked earlier in one of our earlier um, uh, broadcasts, our, I think our first episode, we talked about asking the right questions. And uh, many times I would ask people, "Do you think you were once Jewish?" And they'd say, ah, "No, no, no." And then I started to say, "What do you? What kinds of things do you do as a family that may be different from?" other Italians and that's what opened the door and so I start asking about words people use and I said do you ever use any dialect words that are common only to your family and not to other people in the area and that's where I start to um, I start to hear what people what hear hear words and hear uh, and start to translate them and understand exactly what they mean famale is another one make you sick famale now if you eat um, undercooked meat, it will make you sick, famale. But um, the, the phrase famale is used among families if you put on the table a um, latticini, cheese, when you're serving a meat meal. The minute the cheese comes on the table, or the other way around, when the meat comes on the table, if you're serving um, um, mozzarella and, uh, and pomodori and tomatoes, immediately the families with Jewish Jewish origins will say famale, famale. I mean, in other words, it should not be on the table with with the meat. The, the meat, I should say, the meat and the cheese should be separate. Rabbi, I, I have a I have a question, and and this may or may not even make sense, but as I was listening to you, it kind of came to me. When when people don't know where these I'll call them family words come from, do they are they often considered 
what I guess we would call here in the English language more of slang because they they're not traceable to the Italian dialect or is that is that how they're viewed as slang words? Not in a bad way, slang. I don't mean like, you know, sure. in, a, in a vulgar word, but like a paralach, like a bad word. Yeah, no, a vulgar word. No, no. What's really, really confusing is is the idea of um, dialect in Italian versus accents in Amer in American English. For example, there are different words and phrases that people use in the South that you don't hear in the North, that are used in the West, that you don't hear in the East. But generally speaking, the language is the same. In Italian, the language is different. The dialect can be completely different. The way you phrase something, uh, for example, there is a word here, boccaccio, means jar. A jar that you know when you're making preserves or something, you put it in the boccaccio. People in in Milan never heard of a word like that. That you say boccaccio, they don't know what you're talking about. And in in English, in American English, it's not quite so disparate. It's not quite so different. Um, but uh, what I try to do is I try to pay attention when, especially when I'm talking about the things that bring up the Jewish traditions from the past: food preparation, food serving the way food is eaten, uh, and then life, life cycle events, when babies are born, when children are, receive a, when, um, when children receive um, uh, a special blessing when they're 12 and 13 years old, uh, marriage, funerals, mourning customs, those things. I look for the way people express themselves to see if I'm hearing any, any Hebrew, see if I'm getting any Hebrew, or if I'm hearing an Italian word used in an odd way. For example, the word for anti-Semitism in Calabria is not anti-Semitismo, it's odio, which means hate. Very, very interesting. Very interesting that that word would have survived, that the word anti-Semitic, anti-Semitismo, which is a relatively new construct, a new concept in, in, in modern language, is, is, a, is, is described by mountain people using the word odio, hate. Are there other um, hidden Jewish traditions that are found, things that people do in Calabria, that, that come out and are expressed with also words or language? You said something about, about uh, fabrics, about mixing cotton and silk. Does this have a, a linguistic side to it? Yes, it does. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about the word vancale, V-A-N-C-A-L-E, vancale. Now, the um, the sto a sto think of a stole or a wrap that a um, a woman will wear on a cool evening with the fringes at the end on each end. And um, there is a small mountain town not far from where where I'm speaking to you from here in Sarastretta called. Tiriolo, and in Tiriolo is one of the most ancient mountain towns and has one of the oldest Jewish traditions, a, a Judeca, a, a Jewish zone that is one of the oldest here in the Reventino. Reventino is the collection of mountains, of mountain villages here where I live. And one would say, if you were going to put a wrap on, like I described, a sharpe, you would say a scarf. However, in Tiriolo, there are special scarves that are made with stripes, always with a thread of blue, and the fabrics are not mixed. In other words, a cotton uh, sharpe, a cotton, cotton wrap is completely cotton. A silk one is completely silk. A wool is completely wool, and they are not ever to be mixed. Well, I noticed this, and I noticed the shop, and I began to speak to the woman who has been carrying on with a hand loom this tradition from her great grandmother. Probably goes back even further. Her name is um, is is Mirella, Mirella Leon, Leon, which is happens to be also an a uh, an Italian surname with Jewish roots, and uh, and I asked her about these sharpe. She said, No, 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 Rabina, ci sono vancali. These are vancali, and I couldn't figure out why again why vancali. But my little dictionary here helps me out, and when I look inside and I look for vancali, I see once again a a, a foreign word, and it has to do with the embrace of God. So obviously there is a tie between the uh, this particular scarf with the discreet 
fab discrete fibers and always a thread of blue regardless of what color you're making and fringes on on each end longer fringes on the corner on on each of the four corners and this is probably the a vestige of the uh, of, of, of the Jewish uh, talit. Wow, incredible. But someone like you, someone like you, Carl, because I was I was thinking about the um, uh, the word meal in Hebrew is what you could say arucha. Uh mm -hmm. Yeah, tell uh, me something. Uh, would be a meal. Seduda. Say food would be mazon is food. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have that. Um, I'm trying to think what other what a, misada is a restaurant. What are you looking That's for? What well, I was looking for something with that S sound. Misada comes comes to mind. I'm glad that you you said that because there is a word for meal that I'm trying to kind of figure it out. It means the festive meal when a girl turns 12 years old. Now that may be and that may have something to do with bar and bat mitzvah. I'm not sure, but there is it's um, uh, You're looking it's for a word with an S. With an S, yes, and I'm trying well, to think. On Shabbat, your I afternoon think, meal is Seuda Shlishit, the third meal, Seuda, would be a meal also. Seuda, yes, Seuda. Now, the word that I'm, that I'm, that's cropping up for me here in the mountains is Sedua, Sedua, Sedua. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's, if there's some kind of a tie, but that word is only used for a party. And it is for um, and it what is about for women. Pesach? The Passover Seder mm -hmm. is in effect a feast. Yes. It's also yes. an organized meal, so it might it might come from yeah. that. Uh, interesting about Passover that you mentioned that because here people use the phrase La Pasqua de Bre, the Easter of the Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's 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 as though because of course Easter in a in a in a, a very um, observant Catholic country as Italy was more so years ago uh, was a way of saying that you're celebrating a holiday which in Italy is a small holiday but you're celebrating it as a Jew. Very nice, very nice. Tell me, this is not language, but I'm just it just pops into my mind when I was in Portugal many years ago. We went to a, a village in the mountains on the way to Spain, and they said, okay, there is a Judeca, a Juderia in this town. There were, of course, no Jews there. And they said they had found uh, a synagogue, and uh, the synagogue just had a kind of a niche in the wall, which was facing, uh, I guess, east, facing Jerusalem mm -hmm. for the Torah scrolls. But indeed, I th and I'm thinking to myself, this is really, you know, just to get tourists. They're making this all up. And then as we walked around this uh, Jewish neighborhood, you know, formerly Jewish area, or identified as such, indeed, in the stone, uh, 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 what would you call that, the, uh, the doorpost of the building, out of these were stone buildings, indeed, all of a sudden, we find carved into the stone on an angle a niche which would be for the mezuzah, for the scroll with the prayers on it that you would have at the entrance to your home. So um, um, it just struck me, and I'm thinking, did we ever find something like that in, in your neighborhood? Any physical yes. signs? Yes, indeed. And what we have found, well, it's interesting because uh, I often say that, that as we try to discover the Jewish roots of, of Calabria, that even the language is against us, as we've already spoken about. But I'll give you another example. I was just walking the other day to the um, to the the two remaining stone walls of what was once a synagogue, and it's um, about a ten minute walk from where I live. And I I passed a, I passed an elderly man as I was walking. We started had a conversation, and I said, "This is." This is the zone of the Jews, Ibre. And he said, uh, he looked at me and he said, Now that's dialect for Ibre. And it mm -hmm. is spelled I U D I E U, E U D U. Now, Hearing that and looking at it, how do you ever, from a, from an uh, English language point of view, get Jewish out of it? But even when I say the language is against us because in Italian we do not have the J 
as a consonant. It is ilungo. It's long. It's called long i. So it does. We don't have the. If we want to make the j sound, it's done with a g, and that's why the judeca is oftentimes spelled with a g i u. And people who are researching this get. Um, uh, sidetracked because you have to think of the phonetic, the sounding of the word and not look at how it's spelled. But to get back to your question, along this particular uh, alleyway where there may be our remaining now four or five houses, on the right hand side of each of the doors of these ancient houses is the uh, three, is the, are the three pronged letter shin. And it's carved into the side of the doorpost of the house, and it is um, angled inward. And uh, uh, the, when I saw one, I, the first time I saw it, I thought, "This could this be a shin?" But maybe not. But seeing four or five in a row was really striking. And shin is the first, the first letter of Shaddai, which is of another Shaddai, name. Yes. Another yes, I'm sorry. God. I should have explained it. On the yeah. on on the mezuz on the, on mezuzot, we find the letter shin um, often there, and and then of course many many mezuzot modern times are beautifully decorated. But what's common to all of them in the front uh, is the is the letter shin for Shaddai, goddess protector. And what's common mm -hmm. to all of them in the back is the uh, is the Shema rolled up in the little scroll. But back in the day, just like what you saw in Portugal, there was an actual um, um, niche carved right out of the doorpost in, uh, where the prayer would be rolled up and pushed in. What we found mm -hmm. here during during the time when um, a time when people were afraid to acknowledge their Judaism, they would put the angel um, uh, Michael, uh, a statue of Michael holding a sword pointing inward, which allowed Jews to have something on their door for a home blessing that was not saint or holy mother or Jesus oriented but something that came directly uh, from the from the from the Torah so I should plug in here that all of this amazing amazing material and stories and your connection rabbi it's all in the film the secret Jews of Calabria which uh, really was an eye-opener for me I mean to 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 get into the excitement of, of your life and your story and your family and your father uh, uh, having been a soldier in World War II and liberating, I think it was Buchenwald. So, and anyway, I'm mentioning that people who want to take a look at the film uh, can get a link uh, at your website or on Secret Jews uh, and, uh, and it's also available for purchase on DVD. I think everyone will enjoy it. Actually, Carl, just so our viewers know, right now appearing on your screen is a link that you can click on live and it will take you to where you can actually order your copy or find out how to have a viewing. I think we're going to find people uh, who are watching the movie now uh, and you're going to start to hear from them all sorts of new people saying, oh, wow, this is me. I never understood the connection. Here it is. I found it. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. This happens all the time. It happens with people who come by my door, people who write me emails, and people who have uh, seen the film. They feel this strong connection, and they feel as many as many of them say, like Joanne says in the film, she feels like she's come home. So, Rabbi, I, I, I'm, I'm interested that it is is a, often your process when when you're on the mountain. Um, and for those of you watching, just so you understand it, for some reason, we, we lose Rabbi now and then as far as her, her video. She's literally on the top of a mountain, where, as you can imagine, Internet service is not what it is, you know, here in New Jersey anyway. Uh, so, so just kind of bear with us if we, if we get a little of that. But do you, do you find it, um, like you said, even with Enrico, your husband, that he's been using a word his whole life that probably was a word that his grandmother used not even knowing that it was really, uh, you know, a, a, a Jewish derivative, and they just use this in their everyday life until you hear it and your ear says, "Hmm, that's a Jewish word." Is that normally how you come across a lot of these? I do, I do, and um, because there's never been anybody here in the mountains who's been able to make the Hebrew-Italian uh, link in terms of language. Uh, people were doing exactly as you described, not understand, saying using words and not understanding it. Uh, kasher, 
uh, which is um, a kosher, the word for kosher in English and kashrut in Hebrew. If you're not dressed appropriately for an event, non, non, tu, non se kasher, you are not fit. You are not fit to go to the concert or to, to go to church or something like that. And uh, the word kasher comes up in 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 uh, all in many different uh, uh, experiences, lang in exchanges, I should say. It's a word I'm broken for. Many different exchanges. Non e kasher, non e kasher. In other words, it's not right. It's not fit. It's you shouldn't be doing that. It comes up in, uh, of course, in food, talking about food at the table, but it also comes up in these social situations too. Well, I, I think that uh, we've definitely touched on some very interesting uh, words that people might have as a part of their family unit. Um, I actually encourage everyone, as you're watching this, if you're getting those light bulb moments where you're recalling words in your family, maybe even if your family doesn't use it anymore, but you recall your, you know, your grandparents did, uh, this is where you really want to reach out to Rabbi Barbara. Um, and she does some wonderful research where you can find out more about your family's uh, Jewish roots in the Calabrian area. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna tie up this episode. Um, Carl, uh, or let me throw it to Rabbi first. Rabbi, any any last thoughts you want to leave us with? Uh, language is uh, is a wonderful key, but it does take a lot of a uh, lot of digging and a lot of listening. I do a lot more listening than I do talking, and I encourage our listeners to continue, like you said, to listen to their families, listen for words that sound a little bit unusual, and you may not know it that you're using a, a word that is a Hebrew derivative. But we will help you figure it out. And now, I was going to say, yeah, we've all got to work quickly because in the age of internet and homogenization of culture, these dialects and languages are getting lost. Uh, there are fewer and fewer Jews who speak Jewish Spanish, Ladino. Uh, That's right. Uh, the, the, these, I know, I mean, in that sense, we owe something to the ultra Orthodox Jews who preserve Yiddish. Uh, as their as their lingua franca, it's actually quite incredible to walk around in Israel and hear little children, three-year-old kids, speaking fluent Yiddish. As a matter of fact, that's their mother tongue. But in general, all of these dialects they're they're getting lost. And another generation or two, there won't be grandma and grandpa who spoke the 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 language. So now's the time for everybody to kind of buckle down and figure out what all these things are, because in another couple of years, the children, the grandchildren. Won't have a clue. Oh, 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 it's so important, so very important. And if you if you have words in your Italian family that don't sound Italian and other Italians don't use, let us know. We'll see if we can help. All right. Well, another great episode with with your co-host Rabbi Barbara Aiello and producer Cole Percal. You have been watching this week's episode of Secret Jews. Hidden Hebrew, <laughs> Hebrew words and phrases buried in Calabrese dialect. Again, this was another episode of Secret Jews where we uncover hidden Jewish history. Thank you so much for being here with us, and we'll see you at the next episode. <laughs>